We are back. Thanks for joining us in the studio here. John Bradshaw with me, best-selling author of a number of books. Alan Hutner, your host. And we are engaged in the book Reclaiming Virtue. Um, we, uh, I think we've talked enough about virtue for the time being. We'll get back into it. But I, I, I noticed uh, when I was reading through that you put the, the uh, p- prologue uh, of 10 real life stories, even before anything else in the book. And I'm just wondering what, uh, what, why you did that. What, what was the motive, uh, of, and I guess that they're stories of virtue, but, uh, where did that idea come well, from? Well, the, the idea that moral imagination is one of the most critical parts Another, here's another thing. Now, we do do this with our children. We read them stories. They, they get read biblical stories. We see movies. Uh, but moral imagination, the poet Shelley said, there's nothing more powerful because it's, it's, it's gripping you. So I thought I would put 10 stories that were the 10 sources not the, but at least 10 sources of moral intelligence. Mm-hmm. Like, Evil is a source of moral intelligence. So I have a gal that was Miss Bunny of night, you know, who had been incested by her grandfather, and is basically incested by Hefner, uh, and she writes about it in her book. I'm not making this up. Uh-huh. Uh, so she was a Playboy Bunny. She was a Playboy Bunny. Okay. And now she has orphanages in Haiti. Uh, I mean, she's amazing woman, uh-huh. uh, Susan Crabacker. And then I had Tuesdays with Maury. That was about life experience because he isn't talking to the guy like a university professor. He's talking to him like a guy that's lived life. Mm-hmm. And then I have Lincoln as emotional intelligence, which is the ability to move other people's emotions. Uh-huh. And I have uh, uh, Ruby Bridges, who's the first little African-American girl who went to a in, you know, she, she alone was the only black child in the school in New Orleans, had to be surrounded by marshals. And the thing that sustained her was religion. Uh-huh. So religion is a source of moral intelligence, not religiosity. And I make a big distinction between those two. Yeah. And the first one was the guy that was the head of the New York Fire Department, who had William Freehand, who had written a, a, a paper on the fire department culture and talked basically about you can't pay people to do this. And then when the, uh, the, the doctor who's talking to Congress starts talking at, after 9-11, she said, we just built, for, for thousands of years we've had one wall, now we've put up another wall. Uh-huh. And one of the names on that wall was William Freehand. Uh-huh. And then I had Montessori, environment, the importance of environment. And, and you get into Maria Montessori quite a bit in the book, too. So I, I like the way you... Uh, uh, getting back to that girl who did the uh, the integration in that school, when I read that, John, um, uh, you you brought up m- maybe she was religious, but somehow I felt uh, that she had a saint nature to her, that there was some connection beyond with the ordinary mind that was sustaining her like a direct download of some divine intelligence and compassion, and she stayed in that place no matter what went on. Absolutely. There's a film about her, and her name is Ruby Bridges, wow. and her parents were sharecroppers, and Robert Coles, who was a psychiatrist, pediatrician at Harvard, he wrote a book called The Moral Life of Children. And, and the spiritual life of children. Ruby is one of the people in there. And she just is off the chart. You know, Kohlberg did this chart of moral development. Well, you can't fit her in anywhere. See, so you're right. I mean, saintly and, maybe. Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh-huh. And one of the things that uh, Hal Gardner said is that uh, an intelligence, usually you have prodigies. You know, you like you'll have these mathematical prodigies and uh, musical prodigies. Well, see, I think that's a moral prodigy. Mm-hmm. And, and Mother Teresa, I mean, this woman was going to help pe- uh, help a woman out. She was interested in missionary. Uh, anyway, uh, there, there's, there, you're, you pick that up beautifully. Uh-huh. There's something profound yeah. about this little girl. Yeah. And, and another one that stuck out for me, and maybe you talk about this because sometimes uh, one needs to act virtuously 
in split second, like you don't have time to think about it and maybe not even get into the visceral feeling of it, but the uh, race driver story. Maybe yeah, you talk yeah. about that one. It's a guy named Johnny Pagnini, and I, I had a talk show called The Bradshaw Difference. Nobody heard, saw it because it was on at 2.30 in the morning or something, but I had Johnny on the show, and, and this is really a great example because one of the people that affected Aristotle was Heraclitus, and he was a Greek philosopher who said things like, we step and do not step into the same river. Mm -hmm. And he had all these uh, contradictions. What my professor in Toronto, the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies said, he was the first moralist because here's Johnny Pagnini driving on the San Diego freeway. He sees a girl being raped in the back seat of a car or they're hitting her. He recognizes one of them as a gang member, and he sees her legs fly out, and he begins to drive at 90 to 100 miles an hour, weaving in and out of traffic. And finally, after four hours, corners these people and saves this girl's life. Now, what I say, and this is really one of the critical things about moral uh, ethics or virtue, is that for me to do that, would be ruthless. And a, 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 a mistake. Uh, totally a mistake. <laughs> uh, uh, but he was a race car driver, and he taught race car drivers. One of his brothers had been killed by a gang member. He remembered his parents' grief, and all that came together in an act that I call virtue, which is right reasoning. But see, the thing there is, what Heraclitus understood is you can't have a science of this. Mm -hmm. And that's what the absolute moralists have been trying to do to us. Yeah. They've been trying to make it into a science. And when you're de dealing with concrete, singular, contingent situations, you don't have a science. But can you have objectivity? Mm -hmm. The virtue of prudence, which has to be developed, mm -hmm is the objectivity. It's not situation ethics. Yeah. It's something that is developed, and I show in the book how to develop it. Yeah. A, a good uh, tie into that, I think, uh, John, is uh, Abraham Lincoln, which you go into detail, but uh, this, this struck me, just this uh, sentence here. The clear distinction between what is moral because it is legal moral legalism and what is truly moral ethical sensibility is a critical distinction in the process of reclaiming virtue and i i think we we as a society and a culture are leaning towards the latter so so poorly that everything's become legal totally. and um and polarized i actually had three people in my neighborhood in mind <laughs> who, who you know have all their money in the Cayman Islands, brag that they these guys make twenty five million a year before, you know before the bonuses, and claim that they've never paid any income tax, and up to now what they're doing is legal, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know at the time of our forefathers owning slaves was legal, but what I want to say in this book that love is the highest virtue. That prudence is the engine of all the virtues, but that when you love, you do out of love what you would have done out of constraint and duty mm -hmm. if you didn't have love. Yeah, yeah. But when you get to the level of love, then you do it spontaneously. I, I'm going to do one more on this, and then we'll take a break again here because I think these are very important principles. This one from Henry David Thoreau, where you say, in civil disobedience, Thoreau described his experience and set forth his belief in principle, resistance to authority. When a government or any civil authority is immoral, he argued, one must not obey. Indeed, he said, it is a person's moral duty to a higher law to disobey. His simple but eloquent words became a lasting call to individual conscience, internal moral reform, and just action. Seems to me what Thoreau is saying then is even more appropriate now. Totally. Yeah. Uh, Gandhi read that. Martin Luther King read that. If you read Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail, he is saying exactly the same thing. This is the moral thing I must do mm -hmm. because of this unjust government. All right. Well, uh, we'll come back. John Bradshaw, Alan Hutner uh, in the studio together and doing a featured guest conversation around this incredible book, Reclaiming Virtue, how we can develop the moral intelligence to do the right thing at the right time for the right reason. Please stay with us. Come back. We'll do more.